In this update, we're going to be talking about the La Nina that is coming by summer and also what could be a record hurricane season ahead. If we take a look at the latest Enzo Outlook, which officially actually came out this morning, we can actually see in this red shaded area, that is El Nino. That's where we are currently right now and where we've been since June the 8th. But as we get into next month, that is an Enzo neutral, and we now have an 85% probability we're gonna be trending out of El Nino and trending into Enzo neutral. And then as we head into summer, that in the blue is your La Nina. And all systems go that we are in fact heading back into a La Nina. And you can see as we get deeper into the summer, that only gets more pronounced and a little bit greater in intensity, especially as we head into the fall months. If we take you back, what El Nino brought over the, over the winter and the first part of spring so far, typically we have a lot more favorable active subtropical jet. And that's exactly what we've seen, which basically means wetter, especially for those areas across the south. And for the west, you have these systems, these troughs that come in out west. So anything that you see actually in green and blue here, that's indicating on the precipitation outlook over the last 120 days, that you've been on the overall wetter side, especially across the West Coast and portions of the South areas into Texas. But as you got into the Southeast here, look at all those areas that are highlighted in blue and that darker blue there, that is your highest rainfall and the most above average and where they've seen a lot of flooding recently. And especially the further up you get into the East Coast, that has definitely been on the wetter side. Now there actually has been some drier sides, portions of West Texas and Western New Mexico, an area, pocket of area across uh, Iowa, as well as into portions of Kentucky and Tennessee, and also those areas across the North where the polar jet was a lot less active. You had a very warm winter, and overall you had a drier and less snowy winter as well. So if we take a look at the latest drought index, that reflects that El Nino. So all the areas across good part of half of Texas and much of the Southeast and across the Ohio Valley and up the East Coast, you can see all the white shaded area, right? There hasn't been any drought whatsoever. You've been inundated with all the heavier rains. Now the drought has been a little bit more pronounced where you've just been mis missing out on a lot of systems there in Iowa and especially there towards Minnesota and our northern states where yes, the winter wasn't, um, it was pretty warm and also drier side with a lot less snow. And of course you had a pocket down here towards New Mexico and far west Texas that definitely needs help on the rain department. So if we move forward, look at the trend folks. Yeah, all systems go that we are indicating in that El Nino now. So we still probably have about another month in the same type of setup that we are in now. And then we're gonna be transitioning into an Enzo neutral. Now the Enzo neutral looks to be not happening very long, maybe about a month or two because all systems go that we could transition into a La Nina by the time we head into that June to July timeframe. And you can see the trend. We actually topped out on that El Nino at plus two degrees Celsius down there in the Pacific. That indicated a strong El Nino. And all systems go, that is taking a beeline southward now. And we're gonna be going back into that Enzo neutral and back into that La Nina as we head into that summer and especially into the fall months. And you can see the transition of the cooler waters in the equatorial Pacific are getting colder and colder and colder the deeper we get into the summer and into the fall months. And here we are right now. This is the current look on the Enzo. And look at the crash, folks. I mean, it is crashing hard. That typically means you have a lot of underwelling out there in the Equatorial Pacific, you get a lot of cooler anomalies coming off South America and, and, and increasing that, you know, cooling off those waters out there in the Equatorial Pacific. So that subtropical jet, it's losing its luster as deeper as we get towards into that June timeframe. But we still are likely going to be seeing El Nino influence for about another month. 
But overall, yes, the trend is there. So eventually the La Nina dynamics are gonna be taken over. You can see the definitely trend. This is the last day, seven day moving average on the sea surface temperature anomalies. And all those cooler waters are replacing that, that uh, warmer water that's been taking effect over the last year down there into that region. But for now, we're still under the El Nino dynamics. So typically what we're gonna be seeing is, is a lot of the same of what we have been seeing, which has a, been a very active spring. It's been predominantly, uh, you know, basically warm central and Eastern two thirds of the US. And then we see the trough out West, which puts the cooler anomalies out west that typically means an active severe weather time frame and that's exactly what we've been in the last couple of weeks and that's exactly like we were going to be in for about another month so you can actually see even next week we have the system coming up the east coast for today but yes we reload as we go into next week and yes we have another significant system that will be building across the plains and this could be yet another severe weather outbreak across the plains and much of the southern plains as this gets really amplified going into monday and tuesday time frame and if we continue to move through that same type setup continues to unfold with essentially the the ridge building out of the central and eastern two-thirds of this u.s the system comes off of shore and then we have yet another one possibly coming in by the 21st time frame of April with another pretty much significant trough building in and likely more severe weather across the Ohio Valley and parts of the East Coast. And then yet we have another system coming in with another deepening trough that will likely impact portions of Texas by the time we get in the 24th time frame through around the 27th. So that looks to be another active period between the 24th and the 27th of April timeframe, essentially from Texas back to the Ohio Valley and the Mid-Atlantic states, again, with another significant, possibly severe weather system. And it's all complements of this type of setup that we are in, and we are likely gonna be for about another month. And here's the temperature anomalies for the next 30 days. And the trend is basically continues with the warmer anomalies essentially for the central and eastern two-thirds of the U.S. with the cooler anomalies essentially out west. So that puts these systems like a conveyor belt. The troughs coming in out west, taps into the warm sector, and then taps into that severe weather threat as it moves across the country. And overall, you typically have a little bit of a drier west coast, and then you have a wetter central and eastern two-thirds and this whole area has been inundated. So the ground is already wet, it's soaked, right? You really technically don't have to have a moisture return coming in off the Gulf. With the saturated soils as it is, as these systems come across, you already have elevated dew points because the ground is so saturated. That means the air is saturated as well. So that is also gonna induce the severe weather threat as well and help it keep it increased for an extended period of time without even the Gulf coming back into play. So you have a two-pronged approach with the, all the wet soils that are already in place. And then you have these very active systems coming across that is just going to make the dew points higher, have the temperatures higher and have the probability of more moisture in the atmosphere heading up into the open levels as those updrafts come in that sets the stage for rounds of severe storms and the likely pattern that we're gonna continue likely for about another month. Because if you look at the setup for the month of April on the 500 millibar, you basically see this, you have a trough west, ridge east. So whenever you see this type setup, that sets the stage for a very active month in the heart of severe weather season, which is exactly what we're gonna be going through for about the next month. But you can see as we trend towards May, right? We're trending out of El Nino. We're gonna get that subtropical jet a lot less active. And so over time, we're trending to that neutral setup. So you can see the trough is definitely not as pronounced as in the month of May that it ha that's going to be in the month of, you know, in the, in the month of April. So I still think you get severe storms, but I don't think it's gonna be nearly as active as what we're gonna be experiencing after we get past the second, into the second half 
of May, but going into June, right? Here's your June. So looking at some of the extended time frame now, what we're gonna essentially see is the ridge starting to build out of Mexico. So they've already got some 100 degree heat coming out of Mexico actually sometime next week. And that ridge as we head into June is going to be starting lifting out of Mexico and likely heading towards Texas. So they're gonna be warming up in a big way, I feel in Texas, especially after Memorial weekend, that is going to set the ridge back in place across that region. So as these troughs come in, that's going to have to go up and over the ridge and would likely have the less active subtropical jet and would likely put the storm placement further north. Those areas into Oklahoma, Kansas, further north across the Ohio Valley and be a lot technically less active in Texas and across and across the south. And if we look through the month of July, there we are as we get deeper into the summer months and as we get into the heart of the summer months, there's that ridge really starting to build and come back over Mexico. It's really setting up shop across the Southern Plains, across much of the Southwest. And that will again, put the storm track even further north, way from that ridge of high pressure and likely put these ridge riders back into play for much of the Central Plains and much of the Ohio Valley as well. But I do feel it continues to remain wet. Spring is already a wet, the wetter times. April and May are already some of the wettest months of the year. And I do feel with the El Nino influenced and just average on far as neutral, May is your wettest month down there in the South. So if you just get average rains, that's still a lot of rain compared to what you would normally get into December and January timeframe. So it puts us still all these areas across the central and eastern two thirds of the US for likely April, May and June overall on the wet side going forward, even though we are likely going to be trending into that Enzo neutral. But what happens as we get deeper into summer and as we get more pronounced in that La Nina type setup, which means overall drier conditions, as the subtropical jet starts to dry up, wow, what do we see, folks? We see a lot of brown coming back for a good part of the U.S. is a predominant ridge. It would likely be inundated over a good part of the summer months. So I am expecting a very warm, if not hot, summer for a good part of the central and southwest part of the U.S. But look what happens down in the tropics. As we get into the hurricane season, top, typically La Niñas are more favorable with less shear out there in the, in the Atlantic to have... A, a, a above average hurricane season. And I think exactly what's gonna happen because look, if you look at the precipitation anomalies down there in the Caribbean, and especially this is kind of worrisome on some of these some of these seasonal guidances, it puts the precipitation right along the coast, all right? Right there into Florida and right along the coast. That is implying that you have a favorable probability of more of these systems that do develop continue on a westward trajectory, increasing the likelihood of increased U.S. landfalls. And that is a concern going into hurricane season, especially if we look at some of these seasonal guidances. And I think we have a more pronounced Bermuda high across the top. So when these when these systems come off the Gulf of Mexico, go, go, come off the African coast there, they are likely going to continue more of on a westerly track and have less of these systems. A lot like we saw last year, we saw a lot of them recurving out to sea. I don't think we see that this year. I still think we get some that recurve out to sea, but I think a lot of tropical waves that come off the African coast are going to continue to be more favorable and track westbound and get into the Caribbean. You can see, look at all the abundance amount of precipitation highlighted over the heart of hurricane season, August, September, October, across the Caribbean and into the Gulf of Mexico, into Florida and much of the Southeast coast there. That's definitely concerning on, on the seasonal outlook that we have such a, an abundance amount of precipitation. If you look at the CANSIPs, that's even a little bit more bullish pronouncing those systems, predominantly keeping them on those westerly tracks. 
coming out of the main development region and heading into the Caribbean and heading into the Gulf of Mexico. And look at, look at where the precipitation is, right? You have less likely these recurving out to sea. And so that definitely puts more favorability for possible U.S. landfalls coming up for the upcoming 2024 season. And if you look at the latest guidance from the Colorado State University of some of these numerical short range, you know, these uh, blended models, yeah, that tells you the La Nina is coming in strong. And there's some indications that at this actually could even end up to a, a strong La Nina. So there's some indications that we go from that strong El Nino to the, the complete opposite of the strong La Nina. <laughs> and so, yeah, that is definitely a concern. And look at all these above average sea surface temperature anomalies printing out one to two degrees Celsius above average across a good part of the Atlantic Basin and much of the Caribbean and much of the Gulf Coast as well. So that is also a concern, especially with the less sheer environment increases the probability of a lot of these tropical waves trying to hold together for longer periods, increasing the probability of them becoming more named storms and more hurricanes and possibly major hurricanes. And yes, look at the blend of the, of the uh, overall numerical ensemble guidance saying the same thing. They have the abundance amount of precipitation in the main development region, but especially there down into the Caribbean and into the Gulf of Mexico. It's not up here across the Northern Atlantic and not where these storms could, could curve out to sea like we saw last year. I think we see a lot less of those for this hurricane season. These are all the reasons why when the Colorado State came out with their update just a couple of days ago, it was actually the most bullish and initial update they've ever issued, folks. They are averaging 14 named storms on any given year. Remember last year, we had 20 storms. We had three U.S. impacts. Most of the systems went out to sea. This year could be a different ball game with possibility 23 named storms to start out the season. That is very bullish. That is on their initial guidance, and they actually updated about four more times by the time we get to August before their final call. Last year, they started with 13 storms. We ended up with 20. And overall, they ended up in, you know, in the, in the August update, they actually revised it to 18 storms. So overall, they're, they're expecting 23 named storms, 11 hurricanes, and five major hurricanes. And if you compare it to the year 2020, which we are, we're in a La Nina, and those that system is an analog this year where we actually had 30 named storms, but 10 of them actually made U.S. landfall. And again, what was more pronounced with that year, you had some pretty big high impact storms. Only a couple of them actually went out to sea, but the majority of them stayed on that westerly track, went through the Caribbean, into the Gulf of Mexico, and unfortunately impacted the United States in some form of fashion. So you had one third of the systems that actually developed that actually it ended up impacting the United States as either a tropical system or a hurricane. So guys, I appreciate you guys uh, watching. Be sure to subscribe to my channel, not only on this Pal Pounder on weather, but also my secondary channel, uh, Pal Pounder Ultra. Uh, be sure to download the app. I have my own very own app now. Be sure to follow me on Facebook and definitely catch me next update. Why I protect you before and after storm.